My first question. In your report, you wrote, uh, although PFDJ abandoned the Marxist ideology long time ago, core values of Marxism is in the mind of Eritrean leaders. Can you please elaborate how you arrive at this conclusion? Um, I arrive at it, uh, should we say, by looking at the facts and looking at the narrative that is discussed when you interview ministers and senior officials, and I work backwards. The narrative of the need to be self-reliant, uh, the need to be as independent, uh, about the struggle, about the continued um, competition with its neighbors. Um, and, um, I mean, I list um, early in this report uh, four or five characteristics of this country. And this country, this is something you see over and over again, the way people talk, and also in the policies that have been taken. And if you work from from that rhetoric, that narrative or rhetoric, and the policies, the specific policies, and you work backwards, then I would uh, see what countries have, have, a, have a similar narrative or rhetoric and have at least at some point in time have had similar policies or similar goals. So I, I don't work from the, the, the regime does not say it is Marxist. The regime does not say it's socialist. Um, it doesn't talk in that language, but what it does say and the policies it does adopt strongly suggest it is very similar to some of those other countries. Okay. Uh, when I read your report, I have that impression, your description of socialist uh, mind or socialist ideology is actually very similar to the developmental state, which I, uh, sure, I'm sure that you have been heard about it. Those countries, for example, in East Asia, and the country you mentioned from Africa, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Botswana, have uh, officially declared that they have this uh, developmental state principle. And that developmental state principle actually have been very active in Eritrea before the war erupted in 1998. And then I would like to see that if your socialist uh, ideology, what you call it socialist ideology, is the same as developmental state or it's totally different at all? Um, as I write in the article, um well, it's, it's different. There's something similar and there's something different. As I write in the article, many of those countries, uh, we can think of the Rwanda example, um, the Ethiopia example, uh, the Chinese example, the Vietnamese example. Many of these countries started in a place that is not too different from where uh, Eritrea is. The difference is that those countries evolved into what we would now call developmental states. Hmm. So um, some of the ideology is the same, but some of the policies are quite different. So I, I think the fact that Eritrea is very focused on social development, very focused on eliminating poverty and uh, providing basic education, these, these let's say, socialist um, policies are very similar to the developmental states, but the developmental states also um, provide a large scope for um, investment, uh, private investment, foreign investment, um, uses the market very proactively. The state plays a large role in the economy, but the market also plays a large role in the economy. They have a very different mix of state versus market, as opposed to Eritrea. Eritrea reminds me of Cuba or the Eastern European countries before 1989, and that there the state was dominant, uh, 
and the market had very little role. Extremely different than what I would call a developmental state. So you don't call it the path that Eritrea chose is the developmental state. But if you some of the ideology is the same, but uh, some of the policy and some of the policies are the same. But uh, some of the policies are very different. So I think I think Eritrea is only half alike, if I may use that expression. Half half of what it does is similar, and half of what it does is very different than these developmental states. And therefore, I would not call Eritrea a developmental state by no means. Uh, what was achieved in the Eritrean economical sphere in between 1991 and uh, just before the war erupted in 1998? Uh, they have been uh, ratified uh, Eritrean 1997 constitution, so an adaptation of uh, uh, Eritrean macro policy, and there is also another paper that the PFPG have been written. So if we see in detail what is in those documents, it shows clearly that Eritrea had a kind of semi-liberal type of economic development, which is more similar to those developmental states uh, principles. So what you are talking about when you assess the Eritrean economy, is it mostly focused after the 1998 war, or you are trying to see the whole picture since 1991? My focus is on now. I did not research the past, and I am not the best specialist on it, so I have no comment on that time period. I have not studied the subject. I'm interested in what the so, government is doing now. So you were not, you, you didn't see the macro policy of Eritrea that was the. I heard that it was more open before the war, yeah. Uh, yeah. but not a lot of documentation, and I did not study the subject. I'm interested in the state of the Eritrean economy now. Uh, not, um, we're talking 20 years ago, so it, yeah. it's a long time ago. Yeah. Why I'm asking this question is, so those points that you raised, uh, which uh, you make that uh, the Eritrean ideology is more inclined to the socialist type of uh, ideology, is maybe has to do with the uh, uh, conditions that was uh, created after the war, which Eritrea have been chosen another path, mostly to defend the country, the security issue, it makes uh, most uh, priority in the mind of the leadership of Eritrea. And maybe that looks like from outside that Eritrean leaders or the uh, policy of Eritrea is more socialist. Um, you're welcome to have your interpretations. Um, and I'm somewhat sympathetic to the difficulties of the Eritrean government. Um, and, I, um, and I am not anti-socialist. Using the word socialist, it's not a negative connotation, in my opinion. I'm, I'm not sure why you imply it is a negative connotation. Um, you sh could be socialist in some respects and capitalist in some respects and be very positive. Um, I think the point of my report was to analyze the way of thinking, and I'm sure the security uh, aspect plays a role in the choices that have been made but I, I do think uh, there are countries that have much, been much more aggressive on growth than Eritrea has been and had similar security problems. Um, okay. I don't think security um, is by itself uh, a complete excuse for the policies. Uh, but again, I, I don't think you should assume socialist policies are a negative. They have some positive aspects. They have some negative aspects. Being very capitalist, free market has some positive aspects and some negative aspects. So um, I, I don't think um, me using this term or, um, or saying that Eritrea has taken that plat, pay, pay, path, I'm not using it as a value, value judgment. Okay. Now we go forward to the, my next question. Uh, you wrote uh, Eritrea doesn't desire to become democracy. Please, can I you explain this? Very much. I, I, I didn't focus on the politics, domestic politics, very much. Yeah, but in your report, you wrote Eritrea doesn't desire to become democracy. Uh, yes, it is true. I don't think the government, just like China, doesn't desire to be a democracy. 
and Rwanda doesn't really require a desire to be a democracy. I think Eritrea is like these countries. Uh, in your report, you wrote uh, about sanctions and its implication on the uh, direct investment opportunity in Eritrea. And uh, uh, I, if I understand it correctly, sanction has a very negative impact on the investment of Eritrea. Could you please explain how sanction affected investments in Eritrea? Um, well, first, I, I would say the lack of investment. Sanctions are a severe problem. Some of the policy choices of the government, of course, uh, limit investment. But since you've asked about sanctions, certainly for most foreign investors, uh, the potential of sanctions or the potential for lawsuits uh, because of the national service, um, increase the risk, increase the cost to do business in Eritrea, and therefore will very much limit the number of uh, players who want to do anything in this country. So uh, sanctions very much scares off lots of people from investing in this country. And those that aren't scared off by the sanctions are scared off by some of the policies. It's not a very easy country to do business, However, if you're a big mining company, the government has been very, very positive and has okay. a very good working relationship with mining companies, but I don't think there's any other sector the government has worked so hard to uh, welcome foreign investment, and that's its choice. It's the policy that's chosen. Well, okay. Well, well, my question is, the sanction by itself has no economical aspect. Uh, is it true? The sanctions have enormous economic implications. It, because of sanctions, most companies do not want to do business in Eritrea. The risk of doing business and the cost of doing business increase. And, and if you're an investor, more risk and more cost are very negative things. You are mostly interested in the fragile states, and you have been done uh, some kind of research on this area. You lecture, you write, and give a speech on this area. And then my question is, do you see Eritrea as a fragile state? Uh, not so much, because it is um, uh, having problems of development and having problems of fragility are not the same thing. I think Eritrea has large development problems. Its people are not as well educated as should be, as, they, as we would like them to be. Um, the infrastructure is not as good as it should be. Uh, the, the, the income level of the population is very low. So these are developmental problems. Problems of fragility are, are problems of uh, relationships between different parts of a society, uh, the nature of institutions. And Eritrea um, has some of these problems, but they're not, they're, not, they're not major. I would say compare Eritrea to Sudan or South Sudan or, um, or Somalia. Eritrea is much less fragile. So in general, I do not think of Eritrea as a fragile state. What is the yardstick uh, that makes one state a fragile state? It's highly fra I mean, Somalia is the best example. No state institutions and high social fragmentation. Somalia is like an extreme example. There's no country. There's a, a government that rules nothing, and mo mainly um, society functions without a government. This is a very good example of a fragile state. And the different clans, the four main clans, and of course some of the minority clans, they, they do not cooperate very well, so fragmentation of society on clan lines is very high. Uh, you could say Ethiopia, which has a reasonably effective state, but has a lot of ethnic fragmentation, has some problems in this area. Sudan, of course, has large problems in this area. Eritrea has less social fragmentation than many of its neighbors. Your advice for international community is pragmatism and reality world assessment. You prescribe flexibility from PFDG side. Does that mean the international community abandoned their demand on human rights and democracy instead focus on other variables? Given the mindset of PFD, PFDG, is it possible that they become flexible? 
I don't recommend that we abandon human rights. What I would do is I would take a broader perspective on human rights. I think there are legitimate um, reasons to be unhappy with some of the choices that Eritrea has made. The National Service, I think, is easily the most um, uh, the, the, the most uh, criticized institution or policy in Eritrea, and I continue to believe that Eritrea could could have policies that would promote its security or protect its security and be less controversial than uh, national service is. Having said that, I mean, human rights can be viewed very broadly. The right to development, the right to peace and security, the right to basic education. Uh, some of these things um, are as equally as important as some of the political aspects of human rights. And I do think there's a need to have a little bit more, or in some ways I would say a lot more uh, broader uh, perspective on what human rights means. Uh, too often human rights is equated with a very narrow set of issues when really human rights is a much broader set of issues. And so I would, I would, I would turn your question around and say, it's not about abandoning human rights, it's about thinking about human rights in a much broader sense. At the same time, I do think there's certainly a lack of empathy for Eritrea's position. Eritrea is in a difficult position because of its relationship with its large uh, neighbor at Ethiopia. Uh, the history of Eritrea has not been easy. The country deserves more empathy I don't think more empathy and a broader perspective in human rights means that international actors should completely abandon uh, their critique of national service or completely uh, uh, not criticize the government, but I do think there needs to be a much broader perspective with more empathy and um, to think a little bit more uh, deeply about the problems that this country has and not just look at it in a very narrow lens. What about the mindset of TFTG? Is it possible that they become flexible? Uh, that's that's uh, you. You should ask. Uh, you should ask them. You should not be asking me that question. But um, I think that's very hard. To, it's very hard to say. Uh, people who focus on uh, human rights, um, uh, especially if they have a very Western perspective, will tend to. Uh, focus on the, the uh, very few issues and focus on it over and over again. I mean, I, I think, I mean, for, from Eritrea's perspective, not only is its history and its um, uh, multiple challenges are, are something that it should, it should be surely much better at communicating. The country is not very good at communicating its uh, position. It mainly just uh, assumes people should understand its position. But also look at this neighborhood. Eritrea is surrounded by Somalia, Djibouti, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Ethiopia. And it's hard for me to think of any of those countries that have a stellar human rights record. Um, and I don't think Eritrea is significantly different. In its, its, it, you could say they're all bad and they all could be criticized, but it's hard to just say Eritrea is so much worse than all the others. I think the real problem is national service uh, does not does not help the country, and the country should have a much more flexible attitude towards towards how it promotes its security. And I think if it was to change its policies, it could accomplish the goal of security and the other goals of, of it has, like stability, security, but do it in a way that would be less offensive. To outside actors. The country is a little bit too stubborn for its own good. Okay. Lastly, uh, what is your assessment about the future of Eritrea, both economically and politically? Do you see some positive scenario? Uh, well, there, of course, are positive scenarios. Eritrea should be viewed, um, given this region and given the importance, for example, for the Amer new American administration, the importance of security and, and uh, fighting terrorism and uh, promoting stability, Eritrea should be well positioned to play a positive role. Um, it has to do some things to be in that position, but there are, and of course the Europeans are ever more worried about um, 
about refugees and so on and so forth. So Europe has put, as Europe and the African Development Bank and potentially the United States government um, could all be changing their, their uh, perspective in Eritrea and developing a new relationship, I do think the country itself should be a little more open-minded about the options it has so that it could accomplish its goals. And this is one of the points of my report as we just started this conversation. Eritrea has some similar goals and similar values to a set of countries that have been far more developmental oriented than Eritrea. And therefore, I, I would, um, I wish the country would try to be a little bit more developmental, maintaining its security, and thinking that if security is so important, development is essential to security because development brings resources, development brings friends overseas, and isolation and not focusing so much on development to some extent weakens the country. I think the country should be thinking more broadly about what it aims to accomplish in its security goals. And uh, more investment would mean more money, which would mm. probably mean a stronger military and a stronger security uh, posture. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. My pleasure.